Welcome to Nugget 147 with Steve Groman, and today is going to be a very unusual and informative nugget, isn't it? Well, it is. I think we probably said that a few times, but this one's going to be considerably different, as a matter of fact. We had somebody take us down in an airplane to pick up our son for his birthday the other day, and then fly us down to a place and uh, for lunch, I guess yeah, I should say. a late lunch. A late yeah, lunch. We started off at uh, Meacham International Airport in Fort Worth and flew down to West Houston and picked Paul up. And then we went to Texas Gulf Coast Regional Airport there in Angleton. To the Runway Cafe. A lot of airports have restaurants of some sort on the on the field, which is always nice. I know when we used to have a plane, we'd like to do that kind of thing. Yeah, we had lunch there. And we were really hoping that the weather would break clear so we could get there. And it did. One of the surprises that I wanted to enjoy there is no longer there. And we'll get to that in another nugget. Who we came across is even even an amazing story. And we want to share that with you today. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, we were just sitting there eating a little more than halfway through, I guess, our meal. The cook came out. And at first we thought it was just the, the cook. We found out later that he was actually the owner of the place. And we just started talking with him. I don't know. How long do you think he spent with us there? It was a good 30 <laughs> minutes at least. It was a while. It, it was longer than we actually had time for. Right. But what he was saying, we weren't about to stop him. And at one point, we needed to-go boxes. And the waitress came back and you asked if we could get some to-go boxes. He goes, I'm not done. And we're like, no, we know you're not done. We <laughs> we want you to finish because he had an amazing story to tell us. In a nutshell, I know you're going to say a lot about it in this nugget. So I'll just uh, overview my perspective perhaps. But anyway, the guy was uh, from Cambodia. Fascinating to hear him talking about how he's gone from basically the killing fields to ownership and restaurants and he actually owns more than one in different places and anyway it's just a, an amazing guy he's been through it's you know it's amazing how many weird things and crazy things and devastating and devastating things and tragic things and such that people go through and still alive but this guy he's been through it hadn't he Yes, he has. And we want to tell you about his story. It was so fascinating that I actually called back on Saturday to get a little bit more information and to get his name and pronunciation and all that. And we ended up spending almost an hour talking together. Here is the story. While we were finishing our wonderful fried seafood dinner that included frog legs, crawfish and stuffed crab and too much catfish at the On the Field Cafe, the cook stepped out of the building to the outside seating area to take a needed break where we were finishing our our late afternoon lunch. The rather short gentleman walked to the end of our table, determined to strike up a conversation. Standing there with a bright blue round cap and a chef's apron, this 50-something-year-old man began to captivate the four of us and spin our fun trip to a totally different dimension. Actually, he is the restaurant owner and often cook at the Runway Cafe. But before I start telling you a brief overview of Mr. Yanara Yu's life's journey, let me provide some definitions that will help as this story unfurls. The name Cambodia Cambodia is the Americanized version of the European name for Kampuchea, the nation of the Khmer people. The language they speak is Khmer. The killing fields is the general term that refers to the years when the communist-driven Khmer Rouge brutalized the Cambodian nation and murdered millions. In the early 1970s, the Khmer Republic had a population of 8 million people and was embattled in what is known as the Cambodian Civil War, which occurred during the years 1970 to 1975. The pro-American Khmer Republic was defeated and the Chinese-backed Khmer Rouge, Rouge meaning red, and they were communists, overtook the nation. In other words, the communists overtook the republic and would viciously rule until 1979. As we listened, Mr. Yu brought up the Khmer Rouge and the killing fields. I told him, knowing the time frame, I thought of that as soon as he began to tell his story, but that I did not want to bring up those words first. He went on to tell how they were forced to work in fields and that children as young as six were required to work long, hard days. Many of these children were orphans as the Khmer Rouge, led by Prime Minister Pol Pot, executed anyone deemed a professional or intellectual or anyone connected to a foreign nation, even missionaries. 
missionaries. The Khmer Republic military personnel were also killed. After two warnings of not following orders of the regime, people would be sent to re-education camps, which ultimately meant death. All these individuals were buried in mass graves, and some even were forced to dig their own graves. These are the actual killing fields and consisted of many locations. This term was coined by Cambodian journalist Dith Pran, who escaped the Communist Party of Kampuchea, also known as the Khmer Rouge. This evil regime ruled from 1975 until 1979, which finally ended when the Vietnamese invaded the nation, halting the deadly regime. It is reported that 1.4 million remains have been discovered, and estimates range up to 3.4 million people were actually murdered in those years. In the late 1990s, we had a service at a Khmer Baptist church in Lowell, Massachusetts. It was interesting to hear a young preacher from Dallas, Texas, with a definite North Texas accent when speaking English, be able to speak perfect Khmer without his Texas twang. Steve did a creation lesson in English as the pastor translated his words into Khmer. This pastor had married a Cambodian woman, and he had a heart for the Khmer people that had found their way to America, escaping the killing fields. That day, one woman told me that many people removed their glasses as they were thought to possibly be intellectuals if they wore glasses, and that intellectuals were killed immediately. The regime did not want any educated people to remain alive. I'm so glad that the four of us were able to hear Mr. Yu's testimony that day. Since I did not want to depend on our memories and didn't think to record him, I called the restaurant on Saturday night. I knew he would be super busy and did not expect him to be able to talk. I just wanted to get the spelling of his name and wanted to fill in a few gaps. An hour later, we hung up, both glad for the call. Back to his story. Mr. Yanara Yu was born in Phnom Penh, Cambodia in 1963. Soon his family learned that their son had a heart condition. He was said to have blue baby disease. On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge overtook Cambodia. Three days later, on April 20, 1975, Yanara's family was forced from their home in Phnom Penh. They walked for 26 days to get to his grandparents' home. But the fact that Yanara's dad was a teacher in the Kratik province, and being an educated man, he would be sought out by the Khmer Rouge, and anyone near him could be put to death. Yanara's dad knew that they needed to get away from his parents' home for their personal safety, as the village leaders knew that he was a teacher and would turn him in in order to gain favor and position with the Khmer Rouge. One of Yanara's uncles had already been taken by the Khmer Rouge. Yanara's family was offered passage to a village in the Porsat province, which is in the direction of Thailand. They would live in Porsat until the end of the killing fields. When arriving in Porsat, his dad was asked what his occupation was. He said he was a taxi driver because if they knew he was educated, he would have been executed. Always armed with both long and short butt AK-47s, the soldiers patrolled everyone and everywhere. The people lived in huts and in a communal setting. Along with children six years old and older, Yanara was taken away from his parents and lived in a children's center. Everyone had assigned jobs. His first job was shooing the birds from the rice fields. His dad was assigned to raise chickens and ducks. His mom served as the cook for the community. She mainly cooked rice soup, which contained very little rice. The food was rationed. Yanara was able to work with his dad. When he turned 13, he became a frontline leader and was forced to dig the river deeper. Standing in chest deep water was very hard work and especially hard on him because he was sickly due to his heart condition. His mother knew that the village leaders needed someone who knew geometry to measure the fields. She took the chance and told them that her son Yanara knew geometry and that he could do the job. This this information could have cost his life, but thankfully it did not. Given twine, he measured the hectare acres for more rice fields. While patrolling and sitting in the trees, the Khmer Rouge soldiers would drink tea sweetened with palm sugar, and oftentimes they would let Yanara join them to drink some of the pleasant beverage. Yanara continued to state that he believes it was God's favor that protected him and his family. As a teen, Yanara spent three years, eight months, and 20 days under the brutal regime of the Khmer Rouge. Yanara continued to state that he he believes it was God's favor that protected him and his family. Which takes me back to one of his opening comments, that he loves this country and is fearful of what he sees. But that is not where his story ends. But this is where we will park it until our next nugget, where we continue with Yanara Yu's story. Thank you.